Okay, Mister, we'll have time to talk and like usual, just put your questions on the chart. I want to also welcome Jennifer Vessels. She's going to be our guest next week. And she, I'll share with you some of her achievement and amazing uh, work she's done. So good to see you, Jenny, first. Thank you. Thank you. Good to be here. And uh, Mark, you recognize Oleg and Deepa. There's some MG100 family hey. here as well. Hey. Good to see you. Hi, Mark. Nice to see you. Thank you so much. So let me get started because um, uh, today I, I, I really want to welcome Mark. Mark is one of these person who has achieved so much and has met all these amazing people. And, and uh, he just is just very normal. He's very humble. He doesn't brag about all the people he knows and the achievement. And I'm just, uh, every conversation I have with you, Mark, is just great. It feels like we've known each other forever and, and I learned from you. So thank you so much for taking one hour of your time today with us and share about your career, your learning, your experience, how you see the future, what you learn from all these people that you work with. Um, and I'm sure there will be quite a lot of questions from this very, very active team. Welcome, Mark. Thank you so much. I feel very lucky to get to know all of you um, and very much appreciate learning from you today. We have people from all over the world. That's the nice part about this team. And they're all volunteers and just wanting to learn from you to, to cascade that to other people and other companies around the world. Fantastic. Mark, can you tell us a little bit about your background? It's always nicer than just reading it from LinkedIn. Sure. Uh, I was born and raised in Silicon Valley uh, back when it was uh, the largest fruit producing region in the US. Uh, so it was kind of the land of fruits and nuts. And in that regard, it's never changed. Um, the only thing that overlay overlaid that really was um, the farmers being, uh, seeing an onslaught in an army of people from 80 countries coming here for the US space program, which transformed the place into Silicon Valley. Uh, people convened here primarily around the universities at Stanford and Berkeley for this crazy moonshot idea. Um, and uh, I think they've never rested since in trying to admit kind of new ways of doing things. So it was interesting growing up at the epicenter of the, in a sense, uh, a, a place that was conflicted between agriculture and technology for the very first time. And um, members of the family and so forth were involved in everything from material science to rocket fuel. And uh, that ecosystem growing up here was very, um, very much disruptive in, a, in, a, in its own sort of bubble uh, working on that project. Um, I went to Stanford and developed uh, the Venture Lab there. Um, that Venture Lab is really focused on trying to think about all the different disciplines that go into creating a startup uh, and that ecosystem of people that are as different from finance to technology to operations to narratology and storytelling and marketing um, and, the, and the financial markets all coming together in that lab to think through what it really takes to create a team with this dream of creating something new and better and that has that is built to last and so i studied under uh, jim collins um, on the project of uh, the built who wrote the original built to last uh, with jerry porus a professor here um, and uh, was very much influenced by you know, what does it really tr take to create a wicked, outrageous new dream to build something that's newer and better and make it last? Um, and uh, in the process, had the opportunity to meet extraordinary people who had done that and, and who had created a life that mattered, um, that had impact. It wasn't about being disruptive. It was about finding a better way, uh, about democratizing access to markets and technology. And I helped start and was involved with uh, here in the US with a, a company that had a vision for disrupting Wall Street um, and had a new way of, of trading stocks online. This is in the 80s. Um, and we took that public in, the, in 1987, just three weeks before the great stock market crash. So our, 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 our big, hairy, audacious goal of, uh, of creating a new type of firm for the small investor, not for the big institutions and wealthy people, where we could give access to all the investment information and, and the resources and, and products and financial services online. We did that 
uh, but we did it perhaps in the worst market environment <laughs> in history, um, which provided its own disruption. 1987, the stock market fell more than it ever has um, in, a, in a single week. And uh, we barely survived for the next five years and then built a company that was entirely digital um, through the 90s. So it's interesting to see during the pandemic, this next wave of digitization, uh, which is something I, I was very much an early participant in. Um, and so that's, that, that's at least a little bit of my short story. I, I wish it was as organized or as brilliant a strategy or project that you and your colleagues here are involved with. Um, but it was, uh, it, it was a, I guess what you'd call a serendipitous journey of uh, disruption and change here in Silicon Valley, really the first FinTech disruptive company. And wow. from that we built the Venture Lab and, and, uh, and since then worked on 37 um, startups uh, and companies that have, that have grown. Uh, last year we took Pinterest public uh, and uh, Lyft uh, was another recent one in the last, uh, last 12 months or so. So I'm, I'm so delighted to be with all of you, uh, reading a little bit about some of your backgrounds and amazing experiences that you've had. I'm, I feel very humbled to have the opportunity to learn from you today. Thank you, Mark. And from all these people that you met, which one was the one or two or three that most uh, influenced you and, um, and why? Yeah, I, we ended up doing a project at the turn of the century called, uh, which was an extension of the Built to Last project. And what we did is we interviewed 500 people who had huge impact around the world in, in their field of profession. So we talked to Nobel laureates, uh, Academy Award winners, uh, Tony Award winners, Pulitzer Prize uh, winners. We talked to people whose names or faces you wouldn't know who worked far from the, the spotlight. Uh, I spent time with Nelson Mandela. Uh, and uh, Desmond Tutu in Africa. We spent time with people who'd had Maya Angelou and, and uh, influencers uh, like Richard Branson with whom I've built uh, uh, entrepreneurship labs. So when uh, people asked me, it was based at the World Economic Forum that we had access in Davos to a, a huge selection of people who were influencers. And we were trying to go for the essence of what success was. Um, and it was interesting to hear people talk about creating lives that mattered as opposed to, you know, fortune yeah. and fame. Um, and uh, I guess one of the people that, that I continue to appreciate and as, uh, with whom we've worked with the last, for the last 15 years is, is Richard Branson, who seems to find a way to have impact on building organizations that last with heart and spirit, um, that are char have a charter around a central purpose that is greater than any individual uh, mission that's larger than yourself and has impact that outlasts you. I'm very much attracted to people like that. And that's been the source of most of the books that I've written and, and the people who've inspired me the most. Richard has been um, outrageous and audacious on the one hand and on the, on the other has been able to uh, have an impact on the world, uh, on the oceans, on the carbon um, environment, the um, opportunity to do work with Amnesty International, um, and uh, so he, he seems to be, I think, an, an, an iconic example of a values-driven long-term leader. Could you explain a bit more, Mark, on, on his approach to what you're saying, the sustainability, uh, lasting company setup? Uh, it's all driven by a bigger purpose, or if you have a bit more insights on that, I think that's a very interesting point. Well, it's built on diversity of thought. Wow. It's built on multiple points of view. And I think that's what is not often understood about uh, how the most sustainable organizations, at least in my experience, those that have had a brand new idea, they almost never have the right idea first. None of us do. And so as they start to be able to provide that service or product to the markets they serve, they learn more from the customers than they ever learn from each other. Um, and to the extent that they have a very diverse international geographic um, set of points of view, people from many different disciplines, ethnic backgrounds, cultural, uh, gender, all of those dimensions really add up to what I would call uh, the opportunity to have diverse points of view. Without those, I don't think we have a frame of reference that can continue to organically version itself forward. 
In other words, there's, you know, I don't know if any, there's nobody here who's ever created something that's lasted and stayed permanent in yeah. its place. There's almost an irony to even saying built to last. To, it's basically built to version, um, built to be driven by an overriding sense, set of, of, of deliverables and a promise made to the market or to, an, uh, to a community that you continue to version forward to make better and better or at least in my experience in Silicon Valley, you're replaced very quickly by the next disruptor. Um, <laughs> you lose your relevancy very quickly unless you can think broad and then be very specific about the service. And, um, and that, so one of the things we did at Schwab was we very intentionally in the early days when we were digitizing, uh, we had a, a very diverse geographically um, and culturally based community. We've discovered that the best investment clubs of groups of communities that, that would invest together. The guys would brag and have great returns, uh, overall averaged out between their huge losses and their huge wins. Uh, the women, I'm now generalizing, I apologize, this is a, a study at the turn of the century. The women would have consistent results, but, but, but fewer of the big wins and big losses. And then when you put women and men together in the same investment clubs, they kicked ass. They absolutely were orders of magnitude better than either side. Uh, in terms of gender, and they do tend to coalesce. We found they naturally did seem to coalesce by sex. Um, and, and it was just one of many examples that taught us that uh, when you come from many different backgrounds, mm -hmm. you're able to version yourself better for the communities that you serve. Um, and you start to represent those, those communities that you serve. And I think that's kind of something that's not often talked about in Silicon Valley, about how having those many different points of view is the strength. Uh, because you have to have, we used to call it hubris and humility. You have to have this audacity to say you can do something better globally, that you can do something that's built to last. That's an audacious, wild view on the one hand. And on the other hand, you, you, you must demonstrate incredible humility to realize that you can't do that alone and, you, and there's no such thing as permanence, that you have to continue to version that to earn relevance uh, in a marketplace. And so that hubris and humility, humility is, once you lose that, then that's why great brands fall apart. That's why institutions, that's why, you know, Rome is burning here in the United States. Um, that arrogance, you need that flexibility of understanding many points of view is, is what we think is the only way to prosper. You do it in your own enlightened self-interest. Yeah. <laughs> you embrace what you don't know and what you don't understand. I think you're the first one I hear from Silicon Valley is not that I follow very much, but that you spot on straight on the diversity and the and the different point of views, and that's what makes great companies companies that last uh, and, and go through the startup process. So I I love that, Mark. I want to keep still the, the question on the high level part, uh, yeah. talking about this evolution is type of companies, and then I want to have one or two questions on our field on projects and so on. But Mark. Great. Um, I th when you look at the current big companies, and let's not get specific, but it seems that they lost a bit their mission of making yeah. life that matters. And, and somehow, yeah. I don't know, intentionally or non-intentionally through algorithms that nobody controls and know, they're doing yeah. more bad to society than good. So what is the social media addiction and so on? Um, and fake news and all these kind of very toxic things that are happening. What, what could be the way forward? Uh, for me, it's somehow scary as well that it's out of control or somebody really, really smart is controlling all these things, but it's scary. Well, if you're, if you're talking about this, this very human tendency to revert to comfort zones, um, uh, it's kind of, you're kind of walk, talking to the wrong guy because I live in a place which is about getting out of a comfort zone. Um, and so I don't even want to pretend to understand what's going on when it comes to climbing in your own silo and making yourself feel safer because you're in an echo chamber and you're, and, and it's terrifying. Um, there, that I think the, the benefit used to be that, that you would have, the, and, and I guess the, the, I, I was originally trained as a journalist, and I remember my Pulitzer Prize uh, winning uh, professor just beating me over the head because I didn't 
objectively demonstrate both sides of a conversation in, a, in a, any story that was written. That was the gold standard. Um, that's lost uh, in, the, in the narrative being all about point of view and, and, and comfort zones uh, in terms of those points of view. For me, if we ran businesses that way, we'd be, we would fail. Yeah. Um, that uh, they, they are the, the ones that can operate with that kind of monopoly or oligarchy are, are few and far between. Um, the, the organizations that are really sustainable have to be listening better. Um, it's, it's interesting how, for example, the, the polarization has been uh, divisive and activating uh, social movements at the same time. Um, the, what we did at, at Schwab in the 80s and 90s was intentionally create a management team at the executive level that was men and women equally represented 50-50. It made us better than Wall Street. Yeah. We'd seen it from our customers. We were taught to do that not out of kindness, but out of survival because we needed to be better as, a, as the underdog in that industry. And now Schwab has three trillion under management um, coming from a choir of voices. I think maybe for us here culturally and around the world where you see pockets of innovation, when you see Silicon Alley uh, in Tel Aviv, uh, when you see the, I was in, in Barcelona, I think there was over 30 innovation centers that were emerging there. Um, it was about getting a collection of, of, of many different uh, viewpoints in order to create the, the, uh, the impossible. Um, and so I, you know, wherever I've gone and whenever I'm looking for investment opportunities, I'm looking for that, that sense of, of, of diversity of points of view. Um, and I think that's the only way you can, you can provide services that will disrupt the, the, the silos that we naturally fall back into. Um, those echo chambers that have become so dangerous. Yeah, no, I think it's, uh, there was a new documentary from Netflix about the topic and uh, yeah, very impactful. So I think it's something to watch. Let me now go a bit level down and say, well, you've seen so many ideas failing and some ideas uh, succeeding. So from a project perspective, um, well, we tend to want to know what's going to happen in order to make a nice plan and then implement that plan, but that doesn't happen uh, most of the cases with startups and so what would be a, a right approach to bringing ideas into reality? Um, what is like the best practice you've seen and, and how that would connect to, yeah, entrepreneurship projects? We, we did a study on what was kind of most highly correlated with success. And let me kind of go just at the 40,000 foot level of, on that and, and, and keep it on this theme of, um, how point of view matters. In other words, how leadership matters, collaborative leadership matters. Um, so what we, when, when we were doing the original research, we did the first study on trying to compare the definition of success for a business or an organization uh, between what's in the dictionary. If you look in any dictionary in any language, and I'd love to have you, you all check my work on this, if you can find, um, the definition of success being anything different than these four, I'd love to hear about it. Um, that the definition of success would be the achievement of goals. So kind of get, getting your project done, you know, make, being able to make progress. That's the one I think that we probably could all still agree on. Um, but the other three definitions that are, that are written about that I think drive us nuts and feel like a, a great contradiction in the world with what we want to teach our children and our teams is money, fame, and power. Money, fame, and power, yeah. That's the definition in the diction, in the lexicon. Money, fame, power, and goals. And we found that a horrifyingly short-termist, and it would justify all sorts of bad behavior, right? And then we wonder why our children are confused, because what's the one thing we want for our children? Happiness. Happiness, yeah. It's not in the definition. It's very and so... This, this was a, a horrifying epiphany, um, and that's what really led us on saying, okay, so let's ask people who have all that other stuff what their definition of success would be. And we did a conjoint analysis, so we did, we, it was force-ranked, uh, like you would um, in a political uh, or in a um, product comparison set. We did a conjoint analysis, so people had to force-rank 
and we're less aware of the choices that we're making around the 36 elements of success that we've heard about. Uh, and we found that if you looked at the top drivers of people who felt that they were able to contribute meaningful success. Now, the cohort was people who had impact for 20 years or more. We didn't do any, it wasn't overnight success, it wasn't short term. It was the people and organizations that had impact could be asked to be on a panel uh, in their industry, whatever industry that might be across 80 industries, um, what their definition of success was. And it ended up being, at first it's gonna sound cliche, and yet it's very empowering. And it was this sense of overriding purpose and mission, which was to accomplish something greater than yourself that you feel a part of. Uh, passion, which often gets confused with purpose, it's not the same thing. Passion has more to do with what you do secretly for free when nobody's watching. You don't care whether you win at it or not. Um, it's something that you must, you feel you must do. It's like me playing the trumpet. You really don't want to hear it. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you really, you really don't. Uh, when I'm when I'm trying to do music, uh, my wife and I met in musical theater, and there's a reason why you've never seen us on stage. <laughs> but that doesn't mean it isn't a passion. Um, and I'm, I'm I'm talking for myself. She's she's an amazing lyric soprano, but really for a profession, she's an economist and an educator. Uh, the passion, though, is something that is is self-generating and intrinsically self-motivating. And then the third area, the third area that was the most common definition of success: purpose passion and performance. In other words, as it turns out, the thing that you love doing and the, the thing that you feel has the most impact on the world, the purpose, also is something you like to win at. In other words, you'd like to be able to move forward. Otherwise, you're in this constant loop of uh, looking at it philosophically or academically and not actually making the project happen. And when those three things come together, people are unstoppable. And it turns out that talented people are good at a we basically, everyone on this call has an embarrassment of riches. You have many choices you could make, many career choices, many paths you could take. The problem isn't finding choices. The problem is choosing which ones to lean into. So it's that combination of something that, you've, that lights up on all three levels. And that's where we found uh, sustainable success. And we could test for this in the venture lab. Wow. We'd actually take, we'd take bets on entrepreneurs when she could demonstrate that she did this because it was personal for her, because it also was something that would make life better or, or change things for the better and disrupt other industries. And she's competitive. She wants, to, she wants to actually deliver on the project. Those three things are the only way to make it sustainable. If you take them separately, then it is just a project without meaning and it's not sustainable. You need these other two things to give you, you're gonna make mistakes, you're gonna have setbacks, you're gonna fail, those things are all table stakes. But without that sense of being connected to something bigger, it doesn't last. And, uh, it, it, and if I just re become a reductionist all the way from this, what sounds spiritual to, to just financial, uh, you know, if you're gonna take a bet on somebody or something and know that the first idea is never gonna work, you have to pivot your way to success. Yeah, that I'm looking for all three um, to, to come together. I love it. I love it. And I love because you start with purpose as well. It's something that uh, in projects we never thought about. If you look at most of the methodologies in projects, always yeah. start with the business case. And I've been a bit uh, against that. I think always start with the purpose. Um, the business case tend to be a bit flawed, optimistic, but if you have a very strong purpose to start your project, then that's what's going to drive the rest. So I can really connect to what you're saying so strongly, Mark. Um, business cases are important, but it shouldn't be the driving force behind a decision like that. I think we're, as, hum as humans, we're, we are context hungry. I mean, there's so much that's thrown at us, whether it's content or... Uh, or just communication narratives that are political, what we'd love to know is the container, the context in which the decisions we're making and the projects we're doing are, are making, are having impact. And when we did exit interviews on bank tellers and asked them why they left, they'd say it might be because of, be because of pay. But if you asked them six months later, it was that they would explain to you, they didn't feel like as a company, we empowered them to help customers. 
they, they had they felt they didn't feel good at the end of the day they hadn't they hadn't felt like we had their back to help them make impact on people so we are driven that way and i'm i'm lucky i'm 62 but we had our first and only child on our 20th anniversary wow uh, and uh and and, and, and Benita's at the at Wharton at the University of Pennsylvania, and and I was at Stanford, and and we finally had serendipity strike uh, and became parents uh, at 43. And what's amazing about having Gen Z, who's sheltering in place with us, finishing her final year at University of California Berkeley, obviously following in the smart route, she's following in her mom's footsteps as an economist and an educator, <laughs> um, and and. It's remarkable to see Gen Z be so connected to a sharing economy, yeah. which as, a, as, as I'm at the tail end of the boomers, it was all about acquisition, right? It was all, all about having this big obsolete albatross of a house that I'm now selling. Yeah. Um, but that was a big goal for me. And uh, it, it is actually rather inspiring um, to see how the kids are really looking towards in the indexing towards meaning uh, and sharing. Of course, we, we have a hundred negative things we always say about the latest generation, right? But I, coming to the party late, she's my guru. Uh, I'm, I'm learning so much from what now is the largest generation. We better all learn from her. It's in our, once again, aligned self-interest because she's the one whose world we left on fire <clears throat> on the one hand, um, and it looks rather dystopian here today because we have so much fuel and so much uh, fire going here in California, 523 fires. You can't even see the sunlight and it's uh, 8 a.m. in the morning. So it looks like an episode from Blade Runner. Uh, yeah. You have a pandemic going on the one hand and we were asked to evacuate this house two weeks ago. So uh, th this is the world that we've left this girl. Yeah. And I think it's gonna inform the way the new normal uh, proceeds from here. It's tough. Yeah, it's tough. Let me go to the to the group, to the questions. Manuel, can you tell us where you're calling and share your comment, question, thought briefly, please? Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Manuel from Pamplona, from Spain, the north of Spain. Um, just a question when you were talking about these uh, inspiring people that, that you mentioned. Um, do you see that there are some core uh, common values or common attitudes or um, thoughts, ways of acting uh, among all of them that you could... Yes, I mean, that, that's really what I was referring to when I was talking about purpose, passion, and performance, that we were looking for guidance exactly of the nature that you're describing, which was, is, are there some common traits to the people who had uh, at least two decades of impact in their field of profession, as opposed to those that were short-termist, that were just being driven you know, by quarterly results in the financial sense. And, and that's when we did this first survey working with Harvard and Wharton um, to try to ask this cohort of successful people their definition of success. And I'll send you all the studies. So actually Antonio can forward it to you um, where we did, we, we did the white paper that I'll, I can share with you. Um, we, really the first time success had been asked in that way because otherwise it's just this kind of bright shiny object that feels either horribly superficial or strangely seductive. Uh, I mean, what the hell is success? And so that's really what we wanted to know, what people who had had lasting impact defined as success. And that's when we were surprised to see that it wasn't just a sense of purpose, nor was it just a sense of performance, getting stuff done, or was, nor was it just being passionate, because then you never get anything done, but you're kind of happy for a while until you're <laughs> not able to do it anymore. The, when those three things came together, it lasts because they feed each other. When you find that you're losing your sense of mission, it's actually helpful to go back to the project plan and say, wait, no, let's do tasks today. I don't feel like a leader. I feel I, it, life sucks. We just had a big setback. I'm going to just get back to the work and deliver this quarter. Or when I'm feeling, um, feeling like it's just a superficial project, then I'm going to go back and say, no, Here's the purpose. This is why we're trying to do this. And this is why when we have failures, it's so important. If we don't do this, no one else will lead this way. Uh, with, when we were doing Schwab, it was about democratizing access to financial services for 
for people with low net worth, not the high net worth, but to give them all the services of high net worth. So the Goldman's and the Merrill's hated us. They wouldn't even rent space to us in buildings in New York City. We were kind of, we were blacklisted from the financial markets because we were trying to be uh, this, uh, you know, the, the earlier version of Robin Hood without the excessive trading. Um, but we had this naive and audacious goal that we thought we could make uh, in the investment markets more ethical, uh, less ripe with brokers. So we didn't have stock brokers. We didn't have the conflicts of interest. So when we are having really shitty days, we could go back to, here's why we're doing this. So we found that those three factors, purpose, passion, and performance, are interdependent. And, uh, and, and passion, for some reason, also, also was highly correlated with, I, I happened to meet Steve Jobs in high school. Um, and I'm embarrassed to say where. We were in detention together at uh, <laughs> Homestead High School in Cupertino because we had a tendency to, uh, we, we, tend, we had a tendency to be more creative, I'll put it that way, than we should be. Uh, in an institutional public school. Um, and uh, that doesn't make me his equal, that just makes me as bad as he was on his worst days. Um, and uh, what was interesting to see when he was dying, I had an opportunity to reconnect with him later. I wasn't smart enough to get involved in Apple at all. He actually scared the hell out of me. He was such a tyrant, um, not a nice person. Yeah. Uh, I met him later when, um, I was chairman of a company called Reoport that was pioneering the MP3 player, which is still on your phone. It's the digital audio player. Uh, and he came up to me at the end of a presentation at the Stanford lab and said, MP3 and digital audio is the hottest thing. It's going to transform the world. Digital, you're, you're onto something amazing, but you're totally screwing it up. You've got a geeky piece of crap that you've built, and I'm going to crush you in about two years. That was my reintroduction to Steve. <laughs> and he was right um, about that. Um, that it was about trying to make it simple, easy, accessible, and open. I should, we should be following the same rules that we started at Schwab, which mm -hmm. is, so that, that's a longer answer to your question, but that it was, we did find that across all of the cohort of, of people who had been successful for a long time as the distinction from short-termism, which we're all suffering, I think. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Manuel. For I think this is like a formula, winning formula. I love it. The more I hear, the more I love it, Mark. Let me go to Jennifer. You wanted to comment briefly and then Mark Prinsky. Where are you calling Jennifer from? Thank, thank you. So, so Mark, I'm a, a neighbor in ways. I live in Redwood City in Silicon Valley oh. and uh, not, not native. I moved there in the 80s. I, I've grown up basically there and uh, agree 100% with everything you described. I am currently uh, sheltering in place in Norway, which okay. I can honestly say is like an alternate reality as I see the orange skies from all of my friends and clients. Uh, yeah. We're in an amazing place here, but uh, yeah, but I, I so appreciate all of your comments and I work with a lot of large companies and small companies. And I mean, I would say that in the last nine months, <clears throat> it's been a huge shift in mindset globally of people mm -hmm. recognizing that the way we have managed our lives, our business, our KPIs, is not sustainable. Right. And I, I personally am just so excited about this opportunity that we have as we have a much greater awareness of what diversity really means. Right. The need to collaborate, the need to think differently, and to define purpose, passion, and performance. I, I love what you've said. I, I've actually had 10 conversations already today, considering it's 5.30 p.m. here, <laughs> around the importance of purpose right now. So uh, yes. that, that's my, my first general comment. My, my question to you is, what are your thoughts on how each of us as individuals can go forward from today? What can we each do when we end this call in 20 minutes to, to start being the change we want to see and, and working yeah. better together? I think that uh, I, I've referred to Benita, uh, Dr. Benita Thompson, my partner and colleague and, and spouse. She's doing work focused entirely around collaboration. Um, and you know what, that, that used to be kind of too much of a fuzzy project for the business oriented world, right? To say we've got to collaborate because it was, it's tantamount to saying, well, I'm going to have to compromise. 
or I'm going to have to dumb down what I'm doing so I can be nice and warm and fuzzy with, with everyone. Well, that's not what collaboration means at all. It means that we have um, that the, the most violent discussions we have are around arguing over the issue instead of against each other. Mm -hmm. that, we're, that we're so motivated by the purpose uh, and we want to get stuff done that, we're, that that collaboration's about rallying around a common goal. Now, I wasn't an athlete. I mean, we were musical theater people and I, so I don't even understand sports, so I apologize. Um, but I do now understand being a CEO coach, which I spend all my time with CEOs or CEOs to be. That's my entire practice for the last 30 years. I'm focused just at the tip of the spear. And while I'm not scalable with my time, they are. They have huge impact on what you're talking about, Jennifer, right? They just, leadership matters. We're just seeing just how disastrous it is uh, when we don't have leadership. Um, at scale right now, at, at massive scale. So to answer your question, I'd say that having that project um, that relates to some area that you feel lights up your three Ps, mm -hmm. something that you feel is purposeful, something that you would do secretly, which you are doing secretly for free, and yet it's something you get lost doing in time. If you, if you think about the definition of passion, for example, this is probably the hardest to identify. It's something that you lose track of time doing. It's something that, um, as I said, you, 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 you don't need to be paid for because it's, it's intrinsic motivation. Mm -hmm. uh, it's something that others don't understand. And at some level, you really just don't give a damn that they do or not <laughs> because it's actually, it actually is for you. It should be for you. We did find that one thing that people don't talk about that was common among this cohort that Manuel was asking about was that they all had a portfolio of passions. There isn't just one thing to do with your life. We found that everybody had that way of decompressing or changing their frame of reference so they could get back in the game. Mm -hmm. You know, it could be a run. It could be, you know, playing trumpet out of tune. It could be whatever that is for you um, that fed you. you know, you've done that. You've got your best ideas, probably not in the office. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, it's just how it works, right? You need to let that subconscious, uh, subconscious mind process. So, that, that, that sense of um, it, giving yourself permission to let the passion also be the purpose and the business outcome, that's where you get kick-ass results. So think about that project that you might participate in that, that lights your sky. That's not a trivial exercise. Mm -hmm. I have a whole process that I take people through six months to find their, what's next for them. Mm -hmm. uh, because as I said, they have an embarrassment of riches. They have too many choices and too little time. So being selective about something and being selfish enough about to say that it lights up all three. That isn't just a good thing to do. There's a hell of a lot of good things to do. What would you choose? Mm -hmm. How do you choose charities? I mean, they're all good causes. So figure out something that also lights you up mm -hmm. in a very personal way, just for you, that also has a benefit to the world and that can also have an outcome that's measurable and, and can be put on a project plan. Because as we all know, if it isn't, it doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. That you have to have that performance equation. Otherwise, you're just spinning with purpose. You get exhausted. You never have a, mm -hmm. no purpose is ever done, right? Mm -hmm. and people, if you look at the literature and all the research that, that Benita's done, and it's true in the secondary research as well, everybody on planet Earth needs a feeling of making progress. Mm -hmm. Whether you're a grocery clerk, or you're contributing to the to physics. You mm -hmm. need to feel like you make progress every day. So find that project that you feel like you could have some impact on. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's not as trivial, trivial as planting trees, but something that you feel is meaningful. And, and put a lot of energy into trying to find what that is. It's extremely healing, not just a contribution to the world, but it also heals your soul at times like this. Because mm -hmm. we can't change the politics. We need to vote. <laughs> yeah. If the votes actually get through, I know whoever wins in the U.S., I know that they're going to say you cheated. So yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thanks for the question, Jennifer. We'll see you next week. Uh, let me uh, and I, I just was relating this kind of initiative. Mark started when we saw the crisis. We said let's do something because it's close mm -hmm. to 
our hearts. We want to help. We are la we're the lucky ones. So there's a strong purpose. Uh, there is the passion, but the performance part is where I see we're not getting yet into that part. So that's the frustration that I carry. Although I think we're all feeling good to meet people like you and learn. This is already some kind of benefits for everybody. But still that P, the last P, I find missing in this kind of yes. purpose project. Yeah. But it's very frustrating for our daughter who's at Berkeley, which is a very progressive place that gets involved in policy discussions, really one of the leading environmental schools in the world. And she's very proud of that. She's an environmental economist. Uh, and the frustration she has is the third P. Um, yeah. There's no shortage of the first two. Uh, and and, and that's, so that undermines actually what are gonna be, what one way, what one thing could we do today that would make that difference. And that's true basically with, if you think about project management, that's true with all goals. Correct. Uh, yeah. The, that you, the toughest thing is to feel like you're making progress. <laughs> it's not finding lofty goals. It's right. like, how do, you, how do you just make progress? Um, and that changes the quality of your day. Okay, let me go to Mark. We know his passion I mean, this team already. He wants to train 2 billion kids, empower them even more. Mark, what's your comment? You're on mute, Mark. You're on mute. Oh, woo, 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 woo. it's gone. It's good. That. It's good. No, I'm on. I'm on. I'm. I'm not muted here. Did you mute me? Am I might. We hear you. Okay. We hear you now. Uh, wait, wait. It doesn't say me. You. I you, can hear. You. I can hear you. Can you hear us? I you can hear me. Okay, yeah. I can hear you. Perfect. Thank you so much. Perfect. I, let me begin by thanking you, um, and 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 also Jennifer um, and everybody else, of course, and Antonio more than anything. We uh, we all the three of us live in the same part of the world. Uh, we have a bunch of things in common. I had a kid even later in life than you. He's now fifteen and it had gun. Um, <laughs> and and Jennifer, I'm really uh, very interested in in beliefs change. Uh, globally, and I would love to have some conversations with you about that. Uh, the, the questions that I have um, are three. The first one is we have this idea of diversity, and we all agree, uh, I think, in this, at least in this forum, that it's a very good thing. Uh, but really, what you said is the right thing. It's diversity of thought that counts. But we use proxies for diversity of thought. We use, you use gender a lot. We use uh, background, we use culture, we use many things as proxies. But that doesn't mean if you had a, a board of directors, for example, that looked extremely different, that they couldn't all be, you know, Trump supporters, or they couldn't all be, uh, have similar uh, ways of thinking. So the question is, that, and I have uh, one after this, but the first question is, how, is there a better way that we could invent to get diversity of thought and to ensure it? Is, is there, is, can technology help? Can anything help? But because that's the real goal. It's not the proxy. It's the, it's the diversity of thought. Um, and the second question has to do with direction. Mm -hmm because you could argue very easily that Hitler had all your three things, right? Yeah. He, had, he had purpose, he had passion, he had performance, he got pretty far with it, uh, but he was in a wrong direction. He wasn't in a positive direction. And you could argue that about anybody. You could say, is, is, is Musk going in positive directions? Is, is Branson going in positive directions? So my question is, do you need to add positivity or some form of positivity, or some consensus on positivity to purpose. So you had two questions, or you had three? You I have, have two. I'll, I'll stop there. Okay. <laughs> I do have three. I have lots. I've never run out of questions. Okay. But, uh, let's stop there. <laughs> so um, that's. Uh, I agree, actually, with everything that you said. I I would say that the shift on the proxy question, which is really important to us, because data science and data analytics allow you to find uh, actual behavioral characteristics of, of communities uh, mm -hmm. or of populations. 
so that you can actually get a sense of what they do rather than what they say or what, how they behave as opposed to how they look. So you're right, it's easy to get confused by proxies. And yet that's not, we don't actually look to the proxy to make decisions, for example, on the boards that we form in our organizations. We look to behavioral interviewing. So now what we're looking for is outcomes and practices that reflect diverse behaviors. Mm-hmm. What we're looking for, that's why I used, I was very specific with the term, diverse points of view. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know, I saw so that. You can test for that because people have experience, they've had practice, they have a voting record, they have uh, you know, their own traffic tickets, they have to be accountable to their past. And so uh, you make a very profound point, if we get into the tokenism of the 70s, then it, it actually has a reversion uh, to the mean or worse. Um, what we're so proud of, and the reason I'm, I mentioned gender a lot is because half the world is women. And it does matter to be, and also in the, my second point is to be intentional. So we, these things aren't happening all by themselves. We were talking about what actions can we take to make the world better? Well, it's not a bad thing for me to look to uh, the proxies and then do the behavioral interviewing. And you know, if, if, I'm, if, I'm, if I'm finding people who are demonstrating the very same P, uh, POV or behaviors or practices in the past, then that doesn't represent the diversity that I'm looking for. Um, Before you get to number two, let me just interject that one thing uh, you can, half the world is men and half is women. Half is over 25 or that number may be being lower and half is under that. So another way to divide the world is adults and young people. And we really don't pay much attention to our young people. And that's really my uh, hobby horse here. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, I was on the, the board of Junior Achievement. We have 10 million kids a year that we train in uh, organizational entrepreneurship. So I'm, you're, you're singing to the choir here. And then, of course, being a parent of a, uh, a Gen Z, um, and having her be my guru, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely just as, uh, as, as very much on the same page in terms we of, should I, and being <clears throat> honestly, and being in Silicon Valley where we have 30 year old in, in unicorns, <clears throat> we're not indexed to provincialism or imperial, uh, other sorts of traditions about age. Um, so we, we think actually we have the, we have the trouble of actually having enough old people and young people, having people of every generation represented. Uh, equally. So I, I guess I'm saying that it's about POV diversity, um, but that you do have to be intentional um, about finding those people uh, and doing that extra work uh, to get underneath. Your second question was about the agnostic nature of the definition of success that I provided you. That was intentional. We were looking for the definition of success, not the definition of mor- morality. We were, we were trying to define the ultimate truth. Everyone here who's a caring person should be trying to find the ultimate truth for themselves and to define that and then operationalize that. So the first step we took was to to actually see the perversion of success period, which was money, fame, and power. That's that's where you get what you're describing in terms of the very worst leadership. And so we were trying to find, if we looked at a population of people that we found were a cohort of people that had, I have to tread carefully here. It's really difficult to talk about values. So we talked about sustainability. Hitler wasn't sustainable. And and so we were looking for people who had, you know, an impact for 20 years or more and could scale. Now, does history repeat itself? Absolutely. I'm not going to try to defend the people we hate. Okay. I think we're pretty, you know, I think I probably, uh, I, I'm, I'm wearing a red uh, Stanford label, but I'm pretty damn purple here. I'm, it's you know, all I, those damn kids doing their education online that's slowing down the, the internet. Yeah, right. <laughs> so okay. that, that's my shorter answer to that question, because I know we're, we're getting close to the top of the hour. And yeah, I want, I want to make- get one last question. I see good comments here. Uh, there was Thomas Valenta. You put quite a few comments. You want to share or ask or just the last question we squeeze in? 
Well, I appreciate your uh, your thoughts and discussions here, Mark. And I don't have a specific question. I just gave some comments in the in Thank the uh, in this, in the chat section. So just uh, I I think you're right, you know, and you are a positive person. Maybe one one comment I didn't write down yet is uh, I think for this um, uh, passion, purpose, and performance, uh, what it doesn't include is what uh, kind of values do we do we uh, uh, right. pursue you know I'm, I'm i'm sure trump has passion purpose and performance you know but uh, what are his values and people don't follow him yeah? and uh, neither did they did they uh, uh, did the, the positive uh, values be uh, present in, in hitler or in others what you say you know so i, yeah. I think the uh, the the attributes you showed are true but uh, what's missing is the ethics part the moral part the value part you know there, there is a black and white. There is a good and bad. And um, uh, I think we uh, can agree on what is good, what is bad. And uh, uh, I'm, well, I'm, I'm a little bit researching on, on, on that. But it's also a, a, uh, a matter of discussion and dispute. You know? and, and we are out of time here. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think. Anyhow, uh, what are your thoughts on, on ethics and on values and on good and bad? Well, when the definition of our sense of purpose was with reference to creating positive impact that matters. Um, that the, that's, that the, the focus of what purpose means uh, for us in, in our definition of it was positive, constructive, long-term impact. Um, Whereas these other tyrants, we would, one would hope, while they seem to continue to reemerge re in history, um, are not sustainable and not long lasting. They don't last 20 years. Um, they don't meet the definition of the cohort that we were interviewing in the first place. Um, in, we, we, it was hard to find anybody um, who was fortunately lasting that long. So I like, uh, you know, I like Mark's measure of, of lasting positivity, because that's what we ended up with. It was a values-driven yeah. purpose that usually, as you point out, Thomas, that's what you really can get people to sign up for across generations, across diverse points of view. Uh, and it's something that can be owned and outlast us as a legacy as well. And so that's, that's what all of you are doing with the great work that you're volunteering to come together to, yeah, is to yeah. create that, that positivity and meaning around a framework of delivering results uh, in, in the projects that you deliver. And I, I think we just all deserve to give a big shout out to Antonio. Uh, he's an inspiration to, to oh, me, yeah. all of us here for making this sort of discussion uh, a part of our lives and inspiring us to be better and do more than we would otherwise do without the encouragement <laughs> or the direction. So Antonio, thank you so much. And thank you all uh, for the opportunity to, to, to be with you today. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, everybody. Uh, again, one of these sessions that I want to watch again, because Mark, you brought so much positive and, and, and yeah, it's like I said at the beginning, I love talking to you because you bring, uh, in a sense, so many insights in a natural way. So I, I really want to thank you on behalf of the whole group here. We, we feel inspired. We're getting, going to get that purpose. We have that. We <laughs> need the performance. Yeah, right. <laughs> and everybody come see Jennifer next. I'm looking forward to, to your program. Thank you for your... Thank you. And say hi to Bonita. Bonita is wonderful. Her, the wife is, is like the same, like Mark. Amazing. Maybe we can get her here one day. She would, she, she would be happy to do that. She's, she's actually in the other room doing her Wharton seminar globally as well. Yeah. So... Um, yeah. she, she's much more interesting so that's why you need to start with me thank you thank you everybody take care Bye. Bye. Mark, thank, Bye. You. Bye. thank you thank you